If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. As ever, this is your host, Heather Bayer, and I'm Really happy to be with you now that spring has sprung. We always had this little epithet we used in England. You know, spring has sprung, the grass is riz. I wonder where the daisies is. I've been saying that a little bit recently. The grass is not riz yet here. It's still brown and a little bit ugly. But it will come. We'll get back to some green grass before too long. We'll get, we're getting a bunch of rain this week. So... It, uh, it should start to go green and not so many daisies, but no doubt the dandelions will be along very, very shortly. You know, to us, dandelions are the sign of spring. Um, I used to remember when we were in England and it was, it was bluebells and crocuses and daffodils, but no, here it's dandelions. That's the sign of spring. I know I go on a lot about spring. It's one thing I really, really miss about England you know, as a child, I think it was to do with my mom. She she had the thing about you know spring is the start of a. It wasn't new. It wasn't January the first that was the start of the new year for her. It was always spring and the first leaves coming on the trees and it sort of heralded um, new growth and new life and she got very excited about that and it's something that uh, that she transferred to me and uh, yeah I am I'm a bit of a a spring freak so. You might hear a bit more about spring over the next couple of couple of weeks. I mean, we have to wait until May before we start to see any leaves on the trees. So we've got another six weeks to go. But we should get some warmth. The ice will be off the lake in a couple of weeks. And we'll, we'll be ready for our new rental season. And our rental season started really last weekend at the Cottage Life Show in Toronto. So just to let you know that today's episode is the last of the solo ones I'm going to be doing for a while because I'll be going back into into interviews uh, from next week onwards. Um, Looking forward to that. But I wanted to bring today some of the takeaways that I got from being at the Toronto Cottage Life Show this past weekend. Now, we go to the Cottage Life Show uh, twice a year, in fact, three times a year, three times a year now, because we do the Toronto Cottage Life Show in uh, uh, March. Then we go to Ottawa in three weeks' time to do another one, and then in the fall, in um, October, it's back to Toronto for what they call the fall show. And the Cottage Show is—it's a massive event. It attracts around around forty thousand people over a three or three or four day period. They turned it into four days this year, and these are all. People who own recreational properties, they want to own recreational properties, or or they certainly have some interest in the whole recreational uh, property market, whether it's from a tiny little cabin on a lake to to building um, a monster home. There is something for absolutely everybody at the Cottage Life Show, from septic systems to water management systems, boats of every size from you know stand up paddle boards to wake boats and pontoon boats and then there's all the stuff that people need if they're building a property like decks and docks and floors and windows and and then there's us as a cottage rental management company we are there to attract new owners who are considering renting out So I'm there in my day job as the CEO of one of uh, Ontario's leading rental management companies. And during those three or four days at these shows, we get to talk to hundreds of people who are interested in talking about the rental process. So some are thinking of buying a cottage with the specific purpose of renting it out. Others have owned one for years And they're now being stung by increasing taxes or they want to offset some of the renovation costs. And those latter group of people, the ones who are not buying for that 
focused purpose of renting out, they often tend to be a little bit more reluctant about doing so. They've got a lot of questions. And then we have those that have been trying it on their own for a while with Airbnb or VRBO, and they've run into some snags along the way. And they're now exploring the options of working with a property manager. So in this episode, I wanted to share some of the questions that I heard uh, at the Cottage Life show this year. And I mean, some of them like Airbnb isn't working for me anymore. How do we deal with the neighbors who don't want us to rent? What do you do for the commission? I mean, that's an important one we'll cover first of all. But how do we find a cleaner? Or should we do the changeovers ourselves? Will the renters trash my place? That's a very, very common question that comes up over and over again. Certainly every time we do a show, we'll get one or two people who start out the conversation with, what do you do if the renters trash the place? Municipality um, restrictions and regulations. Um, we've, we've got some, a couple of really draconian ones just been put into place. So I had some questions about those. People are asking about what amenities they have to provide and, uh, and whether they have to accept pets or not. So those are the few, few of the questions that we've had. And I thought I would, uh, I would go through um, each one and discuss, so, you know, we'll tell you what my, my answers were. Now, of course, my answers aren't always the right ones. They may be the ones for this particular demographic. Uh, we, we have a very unique demographic um, here with the majority of our owners coming out of the city of Toronto. The majority of our guests come out of the city of Toronto and, and, its, uh, and, and the surrounding areas. So we're not dealing so much with people buying remotely and dealing with a property remotely. Although having said that, you can be as remote as you want. You know, I've, I've mentioned before that I have a cottage. I've just been down there, actually. Um, it's, it was a three-minute drive or it's a sort of 25-minute walk. It's, it's a beautiful walk in the summer to go down there. I perhaps visit that place three or four times a year because it's a rental and I have a management team, my caretaker, my maintenance people who look after everything for me. I actually don't need to go there. And that's definitely the way that I like to manage my property. I'm just as a, much of a remote manager as, as somebody who lives in England or you know, Europe who is managing a property in Canada or, or has a property in Florida or Arizona or whatever. Remote management doesn't mean you have to be on the other side of the world. Uh, in my case, it means you're three minutes drive away, but you want to be remote from it. That's a lot of, of what my, uh, our clients in our property management company are looking for. They, they're looking for remote management that they don't have to do anything themselves. They, they actually want to pass over the entire management to another company, not just the caretaking and cleaning. And in fact, that leads me right into the very first question that we are asked. And it's become more and more common over the past five or six years. And in fact, when I do presentations... Uh, at conferences, at the VRMA conference, I use this, use this question a lot in the opening, opening piece of the presentation. And the question is, what do you do for your 20% commission that I can't do myself for 3% with Airbnb? Once again, this past weekend, we heard this question on a multitude of occasions. So many people asked exactly that question. Not, maybe not quite in those same words, but that's what they were saying. You know, it only, it's only costing me 3%, 3% of my rate to rent with Airbnb. And, and you're asking 20%. And I don't see that you're doing much more. It's an interesting pr question. And I've refined the answer over the years. And my answer is not always the same. But I said, often come back to them to, by saying, what involvement do you want in your rental? And that, that gets them thinking a little bit. And they often say, well, what do you mean, what involvement? And I, well, you know, how much, do you, how much time do you want to spend uh, emailing your guests, sending them information, answering their questions, of which, as you know, as owners and managers out there, there are multitudes of questions 
for every single property. And I also ask them uh, what degree of involvement they want while their guests are at the property. You know, if a problem occurs, how much do you want to be dealing with the call at 11 o'clock at night from a guest saying, I'm trying to make popcorn and I don't know how the microwave works? It sort of starts them to think about time. And then I talk about what time is worth. You know, if you're going to be spending two or three hours and oftentimes you hear quoted figure of 10 hours per week if you're managing your own property. 10 hours per week is what you would probably spend to manage your own property. If you have your own website and you're doing all your own updates, you're writing your own blog post, you're doing your own social media uh, updates, you are managing the reservations, you're dealing with, with questions and queries and inquiries. As, as you know, those of you who do this, you've got your, your smartphone attached to you because you want to answer that inquiry within the first minute of it being sent. You know, you're priding yourself on doing that. And that's fantastic for those people who want to spend that time, who want to spend that 10 hours a week or more on doing self-management. I have absolutely no argument with that. And those people who want to do that, that self-management is exactly what they should be doing. However, there are a lot of people out there who don't want to self-manage. They don't want to be responding to emails and phone inquiries 24 hours a day. And they would prefer that that's handled by another company. They don't want to be dealing with those calls at all hours of the day while people are in the property with, with the questions and the queries, the questions that say, you know, we've, we've just arrived and I can't find the dishwasher because they didn't read the listing properly and have, didn't realize that there was not a dishwasher. They've arrived and there isn't one and now they're really, really upset. Um, and to, to the degree that we had a family who wanted to leave a property last year because they arrived and there was no dishwasher. Now, some owners would be very more than happy to deal with that. Others do not want their Saturday evening with their family impacted by these types of calls. You know, it may be something simple like what shops are open or the can opener has broken or what do I do with the garbage? These are the questions that we get constantly over the course of a summer. And with 160 properties, you can imagine how many of those that we deal with. But we're talking about in, an individual property. And this, so, so this is what I'm relaying to these people who are asking, what do you do for your 20% commission that I, don't, I can't do myself for 3%? Well, I, I usually start off with, you're only going to be paying a 3% commission if you allow cancellations very late on. If you are wanting a strict cancellation policy, which is maybe 30, 60 days, then you'll pay 5% commission. That's for starters. So, so now we're looking at an extra 15%. I ask them how much they value their time. And if they don't want to be doing all these things themselves, then maybe that 15% is, is worthwhile. So I, I'd be interested to hear, particularly from property managers, you know, how, how else you, you handle that question. What, what do you tell your, uh, your potential owners when they pose it. I did, uh, I did speak to an owner over the weekend who said that he was with a rental management company and they were doing really, really well for him. He, he was looking for some more out of season rentals and he was seeing that some of his neighbors were advertising on Airbnb and, and getting a lot of people in out of season. And I, I got him to have a look at those listings and look at what was being charged for those periods of time. He came back to me and said, yeah, actually it's, you know, $95 a night, $95 a night for a three bedroom property. And I said, you know, with, with cleaning on top, but I said, is, you know, is it worth it? Is that worth it for you? Um, and maybe you talk if, if, if that, if that is worth it for you, you talk to your property management company and ask them if they're planning on advertising on Airbnb or if they would object to you doing it yourself in those off-season times. So there's a way around 
everything and there's an answer to every question. And uh, as I say, I'd be interested to hear from any property managers who have other answers to that question. So sticking with the Airbnb topic, because it came up a lot, and just to put it in perspective, the uh, the Airbnb phenomena has only hit uh, Ontario in the past four or five years, it's, and it's only really just come out into our cottage country areas um, relatively recently, the past couple of years. So it is very, very new to many owners. A lot of them have jumped in and are doing very well. My sister, for example, I think I mentioned before, she she rents the basement of her home uh, on Airbnb and, and she does one night rentals because she's there all the time. She doesn't mind doing changeovers. She'll, she, the last, last weekend, she actually had three separate bookings over for, for three nights. And, and she said, you know, it's just a simple sheet change because she just has the one bedroom. She, she's happy to do that. Not everybody is doing shared home rental. There's a lot of whole home rentals going on now. I heard from a number of owners this weekend that they're finding that the quality of guests is not the same as that that they've experienced when they were with a property management company or, or when they were advertising sort of locally on some of the local Canadian sites. And, and they're saying that uh, the Airbnb demographic seems to be far more demanding. They, they have many more questions. They tend to arrive a lot earlier. They tend to leave later. They tend not to abide by some of the house rules. Now, I know I'm making generalities here. This was the pattern that I was seeing in some of these comments. But one of the questions was, Airbnb isn't working for me anymore. They're trying to drive my rates down. What should I do? And I heard this on a number of occasions. And, and we, for, for those of you who advertise on Airbnb, you know this. You know that Airbnb will suggest rates that are significantly lower than you might have got in the past. Yet the only way to be competitive is to match those, those rates of the other properties that are being shown on, on the page. So, so the, the answer to what should I do you know, it's, the first answer is, well, your rates are your rates. If you want to maintain your rates, then just do it. And if you've got good reviews and the property looks fantastic, then people are going to, they are going to book that time with you if you want to maintain those rates. Just keep in mind who your demographic is. Now, certainly for our cottage country demographic, it's still older groups. It's still older couples and younger families, I guess, but in the, the slightly older age grab bracket. Whereas most of the Airbnb demographic that's coming out of Toronto are of the millennial age group. If you're working with a property manager or you're doing this by yourself and just advertising on Canada Stays or Cottages in Canada or, one of a, or a local site, you will still pull in the, you know, your chosen demographic, which might be the older demographic that's not using Airbnb. Now, I don't know if that's making sense. What I'm saying is if somebody's saying to me, Airbnb isn't working for me anymore, then do something else. Definitely don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't just advertise on Airbnb. Look wider. Look at who the people are that are going to be renting your property. Get your personas set. Decide who your persona is that's going to rent your property and then look to see where they are booking. And you could very well find that your persona, your target guest is not renting on Airbnb. They are coming in by different uh, you know, by different routes, routes, route. I'm going to stick with the British routes. So in answer to the question, what should I do? Go wider in your marketing mix for sure. Get your own website, create your social media platforms and post to them. Make yourself a good Facebook page for your property and concentrate on that. So, so the question Airbnb isn't working for me anymore really becomes a a non-problem because you're broadening your marketing reach. And then the other answer was, well, if they're not working for you anymore, give us a try. 
give a property management company a try, even if it's just for a year, and, and see how we can work for you. And quite often, people are very, very surprised because property management companies, of course, have been around for a long time. They have a huge, they have huge lists of past guests that they are emailing to regularly. So all these people are being reached. The moment you, you list a property with them, then they're going to send information on your property to the widest range of clientele. So you're getting a much greater reach from the get-go. So that was that one. Another popular question is how do we deal with the neighbors? How do we deal with the neighbors who don't want us to rent out? That's a very, very interesting question. We are finding that, uh, that neighbor issues are becoming more and more common. And it seemed to, the, the problem seemed to grow as Airbnb has grown. And I, I don't want to make the, the straight correlation that Airbnb guests are causing more problems and therefore the neighbors are getting more upset and they're just defining everything, everybody that comes to a property as an Airbnb problem. But it just seems that that's, that's been the case. And it could be just that with, with Airbnb, Airbnb's growth, more and more people are renting out. Therefore, there's going to be a growth in the number of, of complaints. So my answer to the neighbor issue is to simply go talk to your neighbors, sit down with them, cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine on the dock, and discuss how you manage your guests how you select the guests, what your house rules are, and how you're going to get your guests to adhere to those house rules. Now, one of the issues with online booking with companies like Airbnb and HomeAway is that they are encouraging you to allow people to book before you've had a chance to talk to them and find out if they're the right match for your property. So one of the ways of doing this is to, to really flesh out your terms and conditions of rental or your house rules, as they're called on Airbnb, and make sure that all your rules are in there. And your guests have to comply with those rules, even if they have, if they have booked, and then you can go back to them and say, I'm, if you find out subsequently that they're not the right match for your property, as long as they are non-matching, if you like, is because they're not complying with, your, with one of your house rules, then you should be able to cancel that booking after you've talked to them, after you've found out more about them, with no penalty. You can always go back to your Airbnb rep and ask that question. But in general, if you're talking to your neighbors, you talk to them about how you're going to screen your guests, the t- sorts of guests that you want to have at your property, and the sorts of guests that you don't. Now, Everybody sees the horror stories, the nasty stuff about people trashing a property, coming along and bringing 60, 18-year-olds to, 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 to have a graduation party and disrupting the whole neighborhood for a whole weekend. So you need to be able to deal with questions like that. How are you going to prevent that from happening? Now, the thing is, the raw thing is, is that you can't always prevent that from happening because people can get around the system. They can tell you all sorts of stories about how wonderful they are and they can be deceptive. But it happens very, very rarely. It really does. If you have all your rules in place and you're asking guests to sign terms and conditions of rental that have clear penalties for things like overcrowding, for breaking bylaws, such as noise bylaws, for any infractions of the rules, in fact. You know, your terms and conditions can lay out what the penalties are. $1,000 per person over the maximum occupancy, for example. We are finding more and more uh, owners who are using exterior cameras. uh, And and when I say exterior cameras, I mean exterior cameras on the, um, the, the driveway side of a property, not the other side, not the living side the driveway side of a property where you can monitor how many cars there are. We we had a recent incident at at one of our properties where we had overcrowding and we were able to uh, access the video 
footage that showed that there were numerous cars and trucks outside the property and also the number of people that were leaving the property. So it was, it was clear proof uh, that the place had been overcrowded and there's just not much a guest can do when you face them with the bill for overcrowding and you have the proof to show it. So back to dealing with the neighbours, it really is a matter of creating a good relationship with them, showing them what you are planning on doing. I mean, certainly don't, don't try ever to start up your rental without talking to the neighbours and, and sharing your plans with them. It makes them feel included. It, um, it makes them feel respected for, for, for a greater part of the deal. So just give that a chance. Go talk to them. The other thing is if you're using a property management company, and certainly with ours, we always tell our, our owners to give a bunch of our cards to the neighbors, neighbors either side, and let them know that if they have any concerns whatsoever at any time during a rental period, they can contact us directly and we will deal with it. That's, that's another benefit of, of using a property management company. So we've found with, um, with some of our owners that they've started out with, with, with neighbors who were not happy with the whole idea of rental and who are now actually deciding to rent their places as well uh, because they've seen it is not the bad, awful experience that some of the media, that the media has actually made out some of these things to be. So next question, which sort of comes back, come, follows on from, from this neighbor one is, will the renters trash my place? Because new owners have seen these media reports. And, and this is, it's tough because from, you can tell from the media reports that sometimes people do. But in my perspective and from my experience, this is such a rare occurrence that it's just, I, I would never say it's not going to happen, but it's such a very, very small risk. And particularly if you put all your ducks in a row before your first guests go in and for every rental, you have a signed rental agreement that these guests are laying money on the line if they break these rules. And this is a legal document that they're signing. It's signing. It's a contract between them, the guests, and you, the owner. So if they break that contract, then they are going to be liable. And in general, if this comes to a court of law and there is clear proof that the, uh, that the rules were broken and caused, uh, you know, any damage was caused or disruption was caused, then the penalties laid out in the terms and conditions will be payable. And, and guests have to go some to, to prove, to, to say that, that you know, they, they can't say they didn't know because they signed the terms and conditions. They can't say they didn't do it if you have clear photographic date and time stamped evidence. So will the renters trash my place? You know, over the course of 15 years in this business or in the property management business here in Ontario, we've had two occasions where guests have left a place in the sort of condition that required additional cleanup and, we, and, and additional cleaning staff in there to get the place turned over in time for the new guests and some things had, had been broken. In, uh, in, on one occasion, we charged the guests $5,000 for damage and uh, excessive cleaning fees and that was paid. On another occasion, I think it was $3,000 worth. Now, that's 15 years of upwards of 1,500 to 2,000 rentals a year. So that, that just goes to show what, uh, what, what the risk is, and it is very, very small. So let's just talk about um, restrictions and how to deal with uh, municipalities and townships and uh, counties imposing certain types of restrictions. And I, I wanted to bring this up because this, this one happened just over the weekend, uh, or we just, we just heard about it over the weekend. 
And I'm going to read out to you from something from a local paper. It says, on March the 8th, Georgian Bay Township Council passed a revised noise bylaw that bans, now listen to this one, human sound such as yelling, shouting, hooting, whistling, singing, and sound from speakers regardless of the time of day or night around the lake. In all other residential areas, people have to tone down their volume between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. And I, th- this, this was just, this was a restriction posed, imposed on one very, very small lake. And there's about 80 properties on this lake. There's about 15 or so rental properties there. Two of them are registered with our property management company. So we've heard from the owners of these properties, one of which said, you know, oh, this is, this is being blown out of all proportion. Yes, there is a bylaw. It's going to be complaint driven. So the bylaw officer is not going to be on the lake morning, noon and night waiting for people to start whistling their dogs or, uh, or calling for their children or shouting for their children to come in for supper. You know, it's going to be complaint based. So a neighbor has to make a complaint in order for the bylaw officer to investigate. Now, this comes back to the neighbor issue. Because the bylaw has been imposed because of complaints from owners, property owners on the lake who don't like the idea of rentals. So this this becomes this circular thing. Um, The, you know, how do you talk to the neighbors who've already made complaints? Because these things have happened on the lake. They're, They're not they're not making these baseless complaints. It's because there has been indiscriminate rentals on the lake and no doubt there have been groups of young adults who have been shouting, hooting, singing, whistling right the way throughout the day. But it's, uh, it's a very interesting, interesting one for us to deal with because we have to go to the renters or the guests and say, look, you've booked into this, uh, onto this lake at this property and this is the bylaw. However, you know... We, we all need to, to tone down some of the rhetoric on this because it's easy to start crying foul about these restrictions and saying, well, this is just people who don't want rentals and they're going to drive us off the lake. When actually it, all it needs is for people to get together and talk about it and for owners who are renting to do it responsibly and to share their responsible plans with the owners who don't rent. Now, I, yeah, I know that sounds simplistic, but it's a darn good start. So another question was, what amenities do I have to provide? Now, you know, amenities, uh, important amenities vary from location to location. So what I'd be telling my potential owners in Ontario might be very, very different from, you know, if, if, if you're in a Caribbean island or if you're in Mexico or Orlando. You know, different amenities suit different inbound traveler demographics. And I know we're talking to um, Erica Muller, who is, who is a realtor and the founder of Vrolio.com, which, which we'll be talking to Erica in the next couple of weeks about Vrolio. So that will, be, that will be coming. But I remember talking to Erica about properties in Orlando, and if you are buying a property, what are the top amenities that people are looking for? And, and she said that um, it's, it's having two master, master suites. Guests coming in just tend to be two families and, you know, in those big houses, and they want two master suites, and they want a proper games room and not just the garage that has had a football table and a pool table um, just thrown in there. So she came up with those as being the top two amenities. For us here in Ontario, number one uh, amenity is Wi-Fi. Now, in many places, people consider Wi-Fi to be, you don't even ask for it because you expect it to be there. But up in our cottage country areas, Wi-Fi is is relatively new. And and in many places, it's still only delivered by via satellite. We don't have line of sight because we have very, very tall trees. And, and it's not always easy to get above the trees to get a line of sight to a tower. Um, 
So we have to talk to our owners and say, this is something you really have to consider when you're looking to, to, to buy your property or to go into the rental market. Can you get Wi-Fi? And we have a lot of owners who will say, oh, no, I'm not, you know, people should go to the cottage to get away from all that. They should be unplugged. Well, and, and my answer to that is you cannot be the judge of how other people spend time on their vacation. Just because that's the way you like to spend, spend your vacation time, it does not mean that your guests are going to be doing the same thing. And their number one criteria is high-speed Wi-Fi. So you've got to do your best and spend and invest to get the best Wi-Fi you possibly can. Another one of our, our, our top amenities is, is a dishwasher. And once again, in different parts of the country, you're going to be saying, well, of course, it's a di- you know, that, that comes a standard. Well, this has not been a standard issue in properties, in, in cottage properties. You know, 15, 20 years ago, it was enough to have an inside toilet, let alone a dishwasher. Um, so, so dishwasher, washer, dryer, you know, a laundry facility is, is really, really important, as is providing linens. And once again, you might be slapping your forehead and saying, well, of course you provide linens. But do you know still probably 50% of the rental properties in Ontario, we still ask our guests to bring their own linens. And it's something that I'm working to, to change because I, you know, for me, obviously, as a professional vacation rental operator myself, I, want, I don't want my guests to arrive on their first day of vacation and start stripping down the beds and remaking them. That is not the way to start your vacation. So I, I will say to any new owner that you need to provide linens. So uh, you can hear from that that your, the amenities you have to provide are very much location location based. I and mean, if if you've got if you've got a condo on the beach in Destin, then maybe one of the best things that you can provide are beach chairs. So people don't have to go onto the beach and rent a chair. You know, you need to find out what are the top amenities for guests coming to your location um, because they, they are different everywhere you go. And then my final question I'm going to talk about is, do I have to accept pets? I'm, I'm really not going to get into this one too deeply because it's, it's one of those topics that invites huge amounts of discussion on the forums. And I, and I know when you get into things like service dogs, it, it can get, you know, the, the conversation can get very, very heated. What I'm saying here is what we do in our property management company and what we advise our, get, our, our owners. And the first thing I would always say, because the majority of our guests come from a, maybe they're driving and they come two to three hours. So it's not a long journey and they often come for weekends and 70% of them have pets. So you are quite at liberty as an owner not to accept pets. However, you are now down to 30% of the market, which, which is usually fine in the summer. But once you get into the shoulder seasons, only being able to cater to 30% of the market, which has dwindled significantly after, you know, outside or in the shoulder seasons, then you are going to find renting your space very, very challenging. So that's my first thing. You know, if, if you want to capture the majority of the market, then you need to accept pets. But we would always say, you know, there is no, dis- no, there is no law on discriminating against dogs or cats. You can say that you only want puffball sized dogs, you know, five pounds or less, or only want hypoallergenic non-shedding dogs, or certain breeds, you know, you, you are quite at liberty to, to differentiate the types of animals you want. And you're certainly at liberty to say no cats, no birds, no pot-bellied pigs. I mentioned pot-bellied pigs because we did have a guest asking to bring a pot-bellied pig last year. Um, we were not able to find anywhere that would accept the pot-bellied pig. And, and I'm sure people out there are going to be saying, well, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with pot-bellied pigs. 
that I just simply was not able to find an owner who was willing to accept George, the pot-bellied pig. You can discriminate in, in terms of, of the types of pet that you allow. But actually, you know, the, the, if, if you're more open to pets, then you're more likely to get more bookings, particularly in the low season. Then there is the thorny topic of do we charge for pets? Now, we don't. As a, as a property management company, we have never charged for pets. We have a cleaning fee, and that cleaning fee covers cleaning up after a pet. However, we do ask our pet owners that if their dogs are shedders, that they use the vacuum cleaner that is provided um, to, clear, to do a good vacuum before they leave. That is part, you know, we don't ask them to do any other cleaning, but if you're bringing a pet that sheds, we do expect you to clear up that hair and also to clear up any dog pet residue from any exterior area. Um, and that we make it very specific that in the winter that we do, just because it's the snow on the ground does not mean that you don't clear up after your pet. Because we know that at the end of the winter, when the snow goes, the poop doesn't. And you, you wake up one morning after a rainfall and all the snow is gone and it's lovely. And then you can see all the little piles on the lawn. And unfortunately, they're not labeled to show which guest and which dog they came from. So we do ask our guests to make sure that they do clear up in the winter as well. I, I am particularly pro-pets because I, I believe that it's, I, I just believe that pets are easier to have around a rental property than children. Um, pets don't use Crayola on the walls or the duvets. Um, pets don't eat their spaghetti on the couch and drop their Cheetos um, on the floor and then grind them in. That, um, to me, I, you know, I don't mind either, either, either kids or pets because I know that my cleaner can turn my house over in four hours and bring it back to a pristine condition, whether we've had kids in there or pets in there or, or whatever. And, and that really is all that matters to me. And what it has done for us is have this constant stream of return guests who bring their pets back year after year. And then we hear about them when the pets pass on and that they've got a new pet. They so enjoy being able to bring their pet they will just come back year after year. So if you want repeat guests, accepting pets is a really good way to go. And that's something that I have been telling people. So I think I'm running out of voice here. Um, there were other questions that we were asked. I think I'll probably make a blog post out of them. You may have seen that I've been doing a few more blog posts uh, just recently and mentioning a company called Avalara My Lodge Tax. Now, Avalara... My Lodge Tax is sponsoring us for a number of, of um, events, webinars, um, Facebook live events, educational videos, and blog posts over the next six months. Now, I only endorse companies or suppliers that I feel 100% confident about. I'm asked a lot to, you know, for, for advertising space for supporting and mentioning suppliers and providers. Now, if, if I don't know these people and if I haven't talked to users of their services and feel really comfortable that, that they are doing a good job for my listeners and my cottage blogger readers, I'm not going to mention them. I'm not going to endorse them. I'm not going to promote them. So you can be confident in my endorsement of Avalara My Lodge Tax. What do they do? They research and assist with any required registration, application, or license forms for lodging tax, accommodation tax, hotel tax, bed tax, whatever they're calling it in your area. They will then determine the exact lodging tax rate that need to be charged. They also prepare, file, and pay all the tax return forms and taxes when due. Now, this can be quite an onerous task because we're not talking here about your federal annual filing, but the, the accommodation tax that your local authorities are imposing on your guests. So the guests are paying you that tax and you have to remit it usually quarterly, which is like four times the amount of 
paperwork that you would normally expect to do. They also provide a record of all your tax filings and payments. And in short, they handle all the details for you, and that's guaranteed. So I would suggest that if you are collecting lodging tax and having any issues at all with remitting it, or if you're thinking about renting out and you need to find out about the lodging tax in your area, that you contact Avalara and I will be putting the information on Avalara in the show notes. And you will be hearing more about my lodge tax over the next um, couple of months. So that's all for today. Next week, I'll be back with, uh, with interviews. I've got a lot of really good interviews coming up. I have set myself a, a, a task of learning more about um, Airbnb and, and you know really the ins and outs of how it works. So I'll be talking to some Airbnb experts. I'll also be talking to some more of the speakers who you will be hearing from at the Vacation Rental Success Summit, which, of course, is coming up on the 20th, 21st of May. 19th, 19th to 21st of May. I must get these dates right in my head. But um, if you haven't bought your tickets yet, I still have a discount code. You just email me at heather at cottageblogger.com, and it's a really good discount. So contact me directly, and I will give you that code. And you buy your ticket, and then we get to chat because... I'm going to have a meetup of podcast listeners at VRSS and try and get you all in one place, in one room, even if it's just for half an hour or so. And you can ask any questions about the podcast and I'm going to, I'm going to pick your brains on what we should be doing in the future with the Vacation Rental Success Podcast because this is episode 226 and we now have over 35,000... Uh, 350,000 downloads of the podcast. So I want to make sure that we, we maintain and actually improve the quality of what we're offering to you. So I, I need to get your feedback. Yeah, buy a ticket, come along, meet up with me, uh, meet up with all the other speakers and network like crazy, as well as learning from some, some of the real Big people in the industry. I say big people. I mean, we're none of us big people. We just, you know, we just spend a lot of time in it and we like to share. So nobody at this, uh, at, at the summit is going to be the sort of person that you don't feel you can go up to and introduce yourself. I've been to some conferences where it seems like they're, they're all off on another level and I didn't want to go and bother them. But everybody who's going to be at VRSS wants to talk to you. You know, we want to share. We want to hear your stories. So I hope you'll come. Anyhow, that's it for now. I have loved doing this, actually. I've loved sharing these questions. And, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll look forward to being with you again next week. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business.